Now, for the bare-picked bone of majesty doth dogged war bristle his angry crest and snarleth in the gentle eyes of peace. Now powers from home and discontents at home meet in one line, and vast confusion waits, as doth a raven on a sick fallen beast the imminent decay of rested pomp. Now happy he whose cloak and cincture can hold out this tempest. Bear away that child, and follow me with speed. I'll to the king. A thousand businesses are brief in hand, and heaven itself doth frown upon the land. That's not a popular Shakespeare. That's, um, that's King John. Actually, um, that's from Act Four of King John. That's a speech by um, the bastard Philip Falconbridge, the bastard son of Richard, Plan uh, not Plantagenet, Richard the Lionheart. Um, so yeah, King John is like one of the uh, least, uh, at least in my ex exposure and experience, one of the least common uh, Shakespeare's in terms of what's performed or what's taught in schools or anything like that. Um, and um, it's a, it's a, it is a weird one. It is an interesting one. Um, I read it a few years ago, and um, and I just kind of tried to refresh myself a little bit on it. Um, I dug in for some speeches, and I found this one by um, by the bastard. Um, the premise. So, for a little context relative to the other histories, some of the ones that I've done on this channel, um, uh, the Henry IV. Henry V, Henry VI, Richard III, that is about 200 years, I think 200 or so years after King John. So King John was late 1100s, early 1200s. Um, and I want to say that the, the Henry's, the, the, the two Henry cycles are uh, late 1300s, early 1400s. Um, so it's... It's, it's kind of funny because it's a lot of the similar types of conflicts, um, civil war, um, uh, you know, drama and intrigue, uh, at the expense of peace, you know, like, so, uh, King John, um, was, <clears throat> excuse me, King John was not, um, beloved and, uh, he was, experiencing some pressure to, uh, abdicate, to, to, you know, get someone else better on the throne. And so he, um, did work to name his heir, Arthur. Um, I'm trying to remember who Arthur is related to. It's not, it's not his son. Um, but this all gets agreed to. Um, but then there's some drama. Arthur gets, uh, uh, uh imprisoned and, um, France is trying to uh, uh, kind of seize this opportunity. And so there's like conflict with France and conflict internally. And uh, one of the weird, I don't know, the, the, I think one of the more uh, commonly identified specific weird points in this play is uh, a moment where Shakespeare doesn't really clarify, but Arthur, who's imprisoned in a tower, jumps from the tower and is killed and it's not really clear the way it's written whether he was committing suicide or he was just trying to escape and like missed like something he was jumping for or something it's very uh it's not very specific in the play and so uh this um this speech right here uh is in the immediate aftermath of that um and uh and what uh, Philip Falconbridge is lamenting in this moment is the, you know, a, a very, uh, uh, a very apt summary of how fruitless and pointless and awful a civil war is. Um, and everything he says here could be applied to the um, War of the Roses stuff, the, you know, 200 years later. Um, and today, you know, like it's, it's not, it's very, these are very universal, uh, issues, you know, and so the, you know, talking about the, the and, and the, one of the things I was drawn to about this speech is that 
the language is so juicy, um, the bear picked like, and the imagery they associate with it. So the idea that the crown, that the kingdom is this bone that has been picked so bare that it's not even, it's, 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 it's not an appealing thing. And yet there's going to be war. There's going to be death for what it's, you know, what's going to, what, how is that worth it? You know, it's already through all of the uh, intrigue and infighting, it's already lost so much of what makes it great, you know, and war is only going to detract from that further. And it's like, yeah, it's, it, I don't know, I find it very relatable that, you know, like, oh, it sucks. Like, why? Why have entire nations, like, rip themselves apart? For what? What's going to be left? It's going to be a broken state. And then, okay, that's your prize? It's like this shell of a thing that could have, that, that, that was, you know, conceivably something great in the past. And so, um, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, the, the specific, the, um, that those first three lines were like just totally hooked me in the, the kind of uh, visceral, crunchy words. Um, the other thing that was interesting to me is that I'm, this is 10 lines and it's excerpted from a larger speech and it's, 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 again, it's, it's less of a, this I think closes the scene, but it's been a back and forth with Philip and some other characters. So it's not like a Hamlet soliloquy kind of thing where it's just him that he starts to, so it's, it's not like people had left and then I take the moment to reflect. Like he's, there has been a dialogue going on, but these 10 lines are structured strangely because the last two lines are like the kind of rhyming couplet that is typical of how scenes end in plays, but also how sonnets end um, or monologues. Um, there are the, the, the last two lines will rhyme with each other. But the sonnets specifically are uh, three sections of four and then the rhyming couplet at the end. So the sections of four have an AB, AB rhyming scheme. And so it's four of those, four of those, four of those. And then the AA, or you know, two, two lines that rhyme with each other as the rhyming couplet at the end. And so this has that couplet, but then the other 10 lines? Yeah, I think I did the math wrong there. I'm sorry, normal sonnets are 14. I can do math. Um, normal sonnets are 14. This is 12. So you've got the rhyming couplet at the end and then 10 lines above that are kind of split into sections, three sections. There are three specific instances where he says now, and it's now a three line section, now a four line section, and now a three line section. And within that, that, within that third section, it's like cut in half in terms of the beat. You know, it's uh, uh, now happy he whose cloak and cincture can hold out this tempest end of a thought, bear away that child. And it's, you know, so it's it's a broken, it's three lines that are broken into two distinct thoughts in the middle of the second line. So it's like, it's a very interesting verse in that way. Um, I'll have to go back and look when he wrote this, but I think it was in the mid 1590s. So it wasn't like the end of his career or anything. I don't think it showed up until the first folio. Um, because again, it was not a popular play, but the, 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 this is a specific example of how some of his verses really mature. Um, because you see that in later plays like The Tempest and King Lear, um, where in like the early plays like Midsummer Night's Dream and uh, um, Comedy of Errors, the language is pretty, uh, at least the verse structure is pretty consistent and simple, you know. Um, you don't see these broken lines broken up. It kind of follows a structure consistently, and that just kind of gets thrown out the window in some of his later plays. Um, and it's, I mean, it's mat It's not unmotivated. It's matched by typically the central characters of the play being emotionally wrought and torn and conflicted. So um, to have that in this play, which is maybe some of his earlier writing, is kind of interesting. So yeah, I want to go back and I, I hope I can like see this play someday. Um, but yeah, it very, very rarely gets produced, um, uh, but super interesting and uh, 
And yeah, I had, a, I had a blast working on this one. So yeah, that was King John. Um, it's been a while since I've done one of these. Um, yeah, I had a couple rest weeks. I um, was traveling, uh, I think, two weekends ago, and then last weekend I was really sick um, with a cold that I'm just now getting over. Um, so I was a nasty, snotty mess um, last weekend. So uh, so yeah, King John. And I should be able to do uh, get back into the normal swing of things with Sonnets next weekend. So yeah, thank you for watching.